Amen. Keep your place there in Romans chapter 7. So I love the book of Romans. I think that's why, um, if you remember from the satellite ministry, that's the, I think that's the first book I ever preached through was the book of, of Romans. Just such great stuff in Romans. Romans chapter 7 especially. Um, Paul here is talking about um, the law, sin, salvation through Jesus Christ. What does the law mean um, for us? Um, he's talking about um, you know, what's the point of the law? If the law is just there to kill us, is it bad? Is it, you know, what's the purpose uh, of the law? And he explains that in Romans um, chapter 7. The title of the sermon this morning is, is a very specific one. I don't think I've ever preached an entire sermon on this topic. But the title of the sermon this morning is The Age of Accountability. We're going to talk about the age of accountability um, this morning. Um, this is a term that is used to... Um, to Talk about the doctrine of uh, children being saved, children being um, condemned. Uh, many different religions, uh, many different religions, uh, you know, Christian type religions um, teach very different things about this. Um, the term is not actually in the Bible, um, but we're going to talk about where the idea, it's a concept in the Bible, and we're going to look at um, that concept in the Bible this morning. So keep your place in Romans um, chapter 7. But first of all, just this idea of the age of accountability is what we're going to talk about this morning. Um, without this idea, the meaning, meaning that there is an age, what, is the, what does the term age of accountability mean? The term age of accountability means that there is an age that a child will reach where he is aware of his or her sin and then becomes condemned by um, that sin. Um, this, of course, is contrasted by the, the doctrine of infant baptism, which comes from the false doctrine of original sin, meaning that you are born um, as a baby with original sin on you, meaning you are guilty of Adam's sin. You are guilty of sin that somebody else has committed. That's against what the Bible teaches very clearly. And then, of course, that's where infant baptism comes from. So, of course, the Catholic Church founded in, you know, 310, 313 A.D., whenever that was. They want to baptize babies. They want to, they want to have salvation be controlled by the church. They want to have, um, you have to bring your children to the church to give them salvation. And infant baptism was one of the methods or tools that they used to do that. Um, just became one of the, what they call the sacraments, meaning you get salvation through this act which the Bible teaches nothing about. But basically, even Protestants and Lutherans, which I grew up in, um, talk about it's the same thing. It's a, they believe salvation comes to a child through baptism. They don't call it works because they call it a means of grace, meaning it's the way God gives that child grace so they can still claim the gift. They, they can still claim free grace, but you have to do something to get the grace. They call it a means of grace. So... Without this age of accountability, you have to buy into infant baptism, original sin, all these things. Which, you know, if you follow that through logically, that a child, an infant, let's just, we'll start with infants because it gets a little bit more complicated as we go into child. But if you follow what that means through, um, that a baby has to be baptized in order to get grace, salvation, then you have to come to the Next logical conclusion, look, it's not like five steps down the linear chain. It's the very next logical conclusion of what happens to a baby that is not baptized if they should die. And, you know, here's the thing. The Catholics are changing on this, as are the Protestants changing on this. St. Augustine, St. Augustine from, you know, the original Catholic Church back in 300 A.D., and the other fathers of the church believed that unbaptized infants, they taught that unbaptized infants share um, the, the same fate as the damned. They go to hell just like everybody else. Of course, they would say that the, the hell that the unbaptized baby goes to was a, was a lesser punishment, which that is biblical. There, there are different levels of punishment in hell. The Bible is clear about that. But they did teach... That logical conclusion, that if a baby's not baptized and that baby should die, they would go to hell. Now, the Catholic Church is, is changing on this over the, you know, over 
history. 800 years after Augustine, there was a French philosopher named Peter Abelard that said dead inf you know, infants that died unbaptized went to a, a cooler place on the edge of hell. And this was a place that he called limbo, right? And this is a Catholic church also grabbed onto this philosophy of limbo. And then in 2007, the Vatican announced in 2007 the results of a papal investigation on the concept of limbo. And that they changed their church doctrine to state that unbaptized babies can go to, can go to heaven, by the way. They're not definitive about it instead of getting stuck somewhere between heaven and hell. Really, the answer that a Catholic will give you is we don't really know, is the answer that most Catholics um, will give you. So it went from basically hell to limbo to maybe heaven, all right, because... Look, as, as people just get more liberal and they don't even follow their own false doctrines anymore. I mean, the Lutherans, the Lutherans are also changing um, on this. Um, if you go and look up, you know, this question on Lutheran doctrinal websites, you know, whether it be uh, Concordia stuff or, you know, LCMS that I grew up in, it, you will read pages upon pages upon pages of supposed answers to this. But here's the bottom line. You know, they're, they're really, what the Lutheran will tell you today is that there is no answer to this. All right? But if you go back to the Lutheran confessions and even Lutherans, you know, years and years ago, you know, the Lutheran confessions say that baptism is necessary for salvation, meaning unbaptized children, babies, they, they are in hell. And look, I have had, you know, you have the advantage of having an ex-Lutheran on your hands here. Not only was I an ex-Lutheran, but, you know, the, the culture that I grew up in was, was very Lutheran Catholic. I remember controversies of people that we know from 50, 60 years ago of the Catholic Church not burying, uh, not doing a burial for, we're not talking about hundreds of years ago, not doing a burial for a child that wasn't baptized. Why? Because that child is in hell. And they weren't going to do the burial for that. And there's a lot of hard feelings and all these types of things um, about that. But that's been happening for, you know, ever since the beginning of the Catholic Church. You know, for Lutherans, I have had Lutheran pastors that were strict, doctrinal Lutheran pastors tell me, because they follow through this doctrine, at least they believe the doctrine, right? At least, I mean, give them that. Like, if they're going to believe a false doctrine, at least they believe the whole thing. I have had Lutheran pastors tell me that the most fundamental Lutheran pastors tell me that, yes, aborted babies are in hell. I mean, it's, it's crazy to think about it now. That never really sat with me. That never really sat with me. But if you believe that baptism gives you faith, that is the conclusion that you must come to for babies, for Children, turn to Acts chapter 8 and verse number 37. Look, if baptism saves you, then without it, babies do not have salvation. Because that's the only way that a baby could get salvation. Of course, we know that um, baptism is not of salvation. Baptism does not save you. Baptism is something that happens after salvation. It is something that we do out of obedience um, to God to show that willingness to walk in newness of life um, in that Christian faith, something that we what? What does Paul say again and again in Romans chapter 7? Something that we should do. Something that we should do. That's one of the greatest words in the book of Romans is just should, should, should. You should do these things. But it doesn't mean if you get saved and by, by trusting on Jesus that you're automatically, everyone's just going to do all these things. You turn into a robot and, you know, God just takes over your life and you're a robot now. It's like you should do these things out of obedience. If ye love me, you know, obey my commandments. You know, if we want to show our love towards God. But this is why they have to take Acts chapter 8, verse 37 out of every modern Bible version. You think, oh, it's just an accident that they took this verse out. Literally, this verse is missing from most of the modern Bible versions. Look at verse number 36. It says, they went on their way, and they saw... So Philip had just preached the gospel to this Ethiopian eunuch. 
He had just told him about Christ and preached the gospel. And look at verse 36. As they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? The eunuch literally is saying, Philip, there's water here. Why is there anything that would stop me from getting baptized? Is there anything that can hinder me? And then all the modern Bible versions just go straight to verse number 38. And if you look, open your NIV and look at it, it will literally go from verse 36 to 38. you think people would be like, whoa, what happened to 37? Because 37 says this, And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He's basically confessing with his mouth that he believes the gospel that was just preached to him. Now, I mean, let's go up to a baby and ask him, you know, do you, do you believe in the baby? It's, it's ridiculous. You have to shut off your brain to think this way. So baptism is something that we do after salvation out of obedience to God. All right? It doesn't give us faith. It doesn't save us. You know, look, and if you want to really confuse a, a Catholic priest or a Lutheran pastor, at, don't even ask them a question about unbaptized babies. Ask them about an unbaptized two-year-old. You, wanna, you, gotta, you ever run into, you know, you're at some event and you happen to run into a, 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 a Lutheran pastor and you want to really confuse them? What happens to an unbaptized three-year-old that gets in a car accident and, God forbid, dies? What happens? They're going to be like, ah, they're going to give you some long non-answer and maybe recommend a book to you is what they're going to do. Because you can't believe the doctrine that they believe without believing that that child is, you know, now in hell. This is why, by the way, this is why um, two of my children, when I was in the Lutheran church and my children were born, they were baptized in the hospital. And the most conservative Lutheran pastors that we had were like, good job. Why? Because why risk it? I mean, if this is the only way they end up in heaven and like you're going to wait three weeks or, or six weeks or whatever it is to get a special outfit and get a cake and all these things and risk damnation for your child for that six weeks, I'm like, are you nuts? Are you crazy? I'm not taking that kind of risk with my kids. But then we started to have liberal Lutheran pastors as time went on. And one the, for the last child that we did that with, the, the one pastor was like, why are you doing this? Don't you want to have a party and have people over? And I'm like, are you crazy? Do you even know what your own doctrine teaches? But he didn't, right? He didn't. He didn't believe his own false doctrine. All right? So look, enough confusion. All right? Enough confusion. Let's look at the Bible this morning and see what the Bible says about children. About children, are they, are they condemned? When are they considered sinners? If there is an age of accountability, what is that age? What is that age? Let's look at it this morning. Let's just look at the Bible. Go to Romans chapter 7. Go to Romans chapter 7. Or you're in Romans chapter 7. So, like I said, the phrase age of accountability is not in the Bible, but the concept is laid out pretty clearly um, in, in a couple of places. I'll show you both of them um, this morning. Look at Romans chapter 7. Look at verse number 7. Let's start out here. Paul's talking about the law. He's like, what's the purpose of the law? If we're saved by grace through faith, what does the law do for me? Is it there to just beat me up, to kill me? What's it all about? What shall we say then? Is the law sin? He says, God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. So he's saying, at some point, through the law, he knew sin. All right? So how did he know sin? Through the law. All right? That's an important point as we go to the, the second point, um, or later on in the sermon, just remember that, that Paul did not know sin except through the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concup concupiscence, for without the law, sin was dead. Concu concupiscence, even though I can't pronounce it, means lust, uh, covetousness. For without the law, sin was dead. Now, here's really the key verse right here. So he's saying sin showed him, or the, the law showed him his sin, is what he said so far. 
the, by, through the law, he recognized his sin. All right? Without the law, he didn't recognize his sin. Now look at verse number 9. This pretty much destroys, this verse right here pretty much destroys the idea of original sin in general. For I was alive without the law once. Isn't that interesting? Now look, the law, the law is, is uh, we have the law written in our heart, and we also have the law of the Bible. In Romans 2.15, you know, um, Paul's explaining that, you know, what about, you know, the Jews? He explains in the first part of Romans, he explains, you know, what advantage hath the Jew? He's like, if everybody can get saved, what advantage hath the Jew? Well, the Jews, they had the oracles of God. They had the Bible. That's an advantage that they had, all right? But then he says in Romans 2.15 that even the Gentiles did the things, you know, according to the law because God had written the, the law in their hearts, their conscience. He explains that every man has a conscience, which is the law written in his heart. But Paul, it's interesting, he says in verse number 9 here, he says, I was alive without the law once. If original sin is true, this statement can't be in the Bible. He's saying, I, there was a point where I was alive. Look, the wages of sin is death. Meaning, as soon as sin is in your life, you're dead. You, you, the wages, uh, you owe death. You deserve death. But he's saying, I was alive without the law once. When was that? When was that? He's saying there was a point where I was alive without the law. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. So before he knew the law, he was alive. This is what Paul is saying. So there's a point that Paul was alive. There's a point that everyone was alive. And then the law came, they, they recognized their conscience, they, they recognized the Bible, and they died at that point. For sin taking occasion by the, what? The commandment deceived me and by it slew me. So the law shows you your sin, and as soon as you recognize that, you die, the wages of sin is death. Wherefore the law is holy, the commandment is holy, and just and good. So literally... The law shows you your need for salvation. The law shows you that you're dead, it kills you, and it shows you your need for the Savior. That is the point of the law. So he's like, no, the law is holy. The law is just, meaning it's fair. It's fair. Okay? Look, that's the first point. Um, that's the, the really the, the, those verses right there are just the, the, a real clear explanation of before you understand the law, you're alive, right? This is a very clear explanation from the Bible directly on this idea of the, the concept of the age of accountability. But look, turn to Romans chapter 3, just a few chapters back. The age of accountability can also be explained clearly in the concept of the gospel itself. Because in order to be saved, step one of getting someone to believe the gospel, to believe that they need a savior. And this is why, by the way, most people that are teaching original, all these people that are teaching original sin, all these people that are teaching infant baptism, they believe a false gospel. Because the idea of, you know, this age of, that there's a, that you're alive before the law comes in is actually found in the gospel too. If you look at Romans chapter 3, look at verse number 10. Look, this is, the, this is step one in giving someone the gospel is that they, they understand that they're a sinner. This is, as it is written, there's none righteous, no, not one. Verse 23 says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Everyone knows that you cannot be saved unless you understand that. You can, I mean, there's no way that you can be saved unless you understand that you are a sinner. It doesn't even make logical sense because... I mean, that's also why it's one of the simplest things for people to accept. People that will get to, you know, the end of the gospel or the midpoint of the gospel and say, well, I, you, you start talking about, um, you know, Jesus and Jesus was God and Jesus was sinless and Jesus rose from the dead and all this. And they're like, yeah, I don't know about that. 99.9% .9 of people will accept this first part of the gospel, that they are a sinner. I can count the people that I have met after talking to thousands of people. I can met the people, 
I can count the people that have told me that they're not sinners probably on one hand. Because that is just a very, it's like the simplest part of the gospel. Just, you're a sinner. You're guilty. And the wages of that sin is death. That's kind of step two. But the point is, if you don't believe that, if you don't understand that, you can't be saved. So just this idea that a child must be old enough to understand that what they do is wrong, that they have done things that are wrong, it's kind of written into the gospel, folks. Just the concept of that there is an age where you can understand that. Obviously, a one-year-old has no idea. They're just, look, a one-year-old is just going around, or a two-year-old is just going around, and look, they're doing what they do. They're, that's why they call it the terrible twos. They're going around, they do what they do. They're just tearing stuff up. And look, they're starting to understand consequences. They're starting to learn those things, hopefully, through their parents. But the point is, before they even understand that there is right and there is wrong and they, they've committed sin, they can't be saved. So there is, there is an age of accountability. They're alive at that point. They're alive at that point. That's what Paul is talking about. So the question is, okay, uh, Pastor, sounds good. When is it, though? That's, that's the question, right? When's that age of accountability? What's that, what's that date? You know, what's that mark I need to put on the calendar um, for my children? So there's a few points that the Bible kind of leads us to. There's no magical date for every single person. Um, I believe it's probably a little different for every um, child out there, depending on their circumstances. But let me just show you a couple concepts again from the Bible to explain about when this is. Turn to Genesis chapter 3. Turn to Genesis chapter 3. So the first thing that we can look at is, you know, when shame starts to appear um, in children. Because at some point, shame will begin to appear in kids. Look at Genesis chapter 3 and verse number 6. Here we saw, here we see the, the fall of man. We see when, when Eve first eats of the, the fruit of the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and they, the man first sins against God. All right, look at verse number 6. It says, And the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree to be desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat. So she sins. This is the first sin. And gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And look at verse number 7. The very first thing that happens after they sin, they willingly sin against God, and the eyes of them both were opened, and what? They knew they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves apron, aprons. So as soon as they had sinned, as soon as they had sinned and they knew they had sinned, that shame entered right away. And they recognized that they were uncovered. They were naked. There is, it, though, it's, they didn't have that shame before. They had no knowledge that there was anything shameful about having no clothes on and, until they were sinners. All right, so look, this is a good kind of analogy, a good kind of picture. This is why young children can run around, you know, with no clothes on after a bath or whatever and just have no shame about it. They just don't care. They're just like, whatever, there's nothing wrong here. They have, they have no, that shame of sin is not with them at that point. Now look, hopefully this is something that's taught by their parents, um, you know, soon. Nobody likes going over to those people's house that thinks it's cute, where their kids are running around with no clothes on all the time, you know. But the point is, there will be a time, even if parents don't teach that, there will be a time when those children get to an age of, you know, my kids haven't been young for a long time, but like five, six, seven years old, where they're just going to be like, yeah, they're not going to do that anymore. Because they're going to start to realize, that like, hey, I don't have any clothes on, and this is uh, shameful. But my point is that a child that is taught that that is, you know, not something that they should do is going to be able to recognize those things much earlier, by the way. And that's kind of a concept that we're going to see this morning as well. So just that shame that sin brings... Is, is kind of a good key or a good um, measuring stick for us um, as parents of when this age of accountability kind of comes in, when kids can kind of recognize shame, recognize, you know, what is right and what is wrong. It's going to be around that same 
time, when they're, when they're young children, you know, when they're younger than, you know, seven, six years old. Um, now turn to Deuteronomy chapter 31. And let me further back this up. All right, further back this up. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 31 and look at verse number nine. So the first one is just like when they start to recognize shame, you can tell that this is a clue in their lives, right? You can tell that this is a clue that they're, re they're reaching that point where they can start to recognize their own sin. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 31. Look at verse number 9. Here's another clue for us. The Bible says this. The Bible says, And Moses wrote this law and delivered it unto the priests, the sons of Levi, which bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord. And at the end of every seven years, in this solemnity of the year of release, in the Feast of Tabernacles, when all Israel has come to appear before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose, thou shalt read this law before all Israel in their hearing. So every seven years, they are to read the law to the people. This is just to make sure that like, hey, you know, if people aren't studying this stuff on their own, if people aren't, you know, doing what they're supposed to do and learning the law on their own, everybody's going to get the law every seven years. All right, look at the verse number 12. It says, gather the people together. This is one of the reasons we're a family integrated church. Amen. One of the places in the Bible that it teaches that children should be listening to the law as well. Gather the people together, men and women and children, and thy stranger that is within thy gates, that they may hear and that they may learn and fear the Lord your God and observe to do all the words of this law. And again, look what it says here. And that their children which have not what? Which have not known anything may hear. It's saying, this is where, what is, when was Paul alive again? Before he knew. So this is one of the ways that they know. They're going to read the Bible to them that they may hear and learn to fear the Lord, your God. Why would, why would they have to fear? Because sin is shown to them through the law and now they have to fear the wrath of God, they need to be saved. See? So this is how they know. This is how they know. As long as you live in the land, whether you go over Jordan to possess it. So how often are they supposed to read the law? Every seven years. So let's think this through for a second. Let's say, worst case scenario, the law is read, and then the next day a child is born. That child is going to be what? about seven years old, almost seven years old, one day before seven years old, when the law is, is read the next time. Meaning that, you know, worst case scenario, we're talking about, you know, seven years old. You know, so it makes sense. Right around that time of shame and understanding, sin, all these types of things. So a child born the next day that doesn't hear the law for what? Another seven years. Obviously, a child that is, you know, born at that time would hear the law when they were two, three, and then seven years later, they'd hear it when they were nine or whatever. So seven years, eight years, nine years, this is a good gauge is all I'm telling you. Why they decided to read the law every seven years and children are mentioned twice so that, why? So that they may know the law. They may know at that point. Here's a third point. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. So first of all, we see that when shame comes in is a good indication of, you know, when, you know, children are starting to understand their sin. The second one is the law was read to people, including the children, every seven years, all right? Meaning, you know, we know that there's not, you know, going to be kids out there that haven't heard the law, you know, in 10 or 15 years. I mean, they've heard the law read every seven years. Here's the third point we can get some clues. We're looking at clues to figure out like around what time, you know, is this age of accountability that the Bible conceptually talks about. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 2. Paul says, For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, and that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. He says, But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. What he's saying here is that 
the gospel itself, he's talking about them being saved through Jesus Christ. He's saying the gospel is simple. He's like, don't let somebody come and complicate this whole thing, you know, the, through subtle means and all these different types of things. He's like, this, this concept of the gospel of Jesus Christ is very simple. Look, the simplest concept in the Bible is the gospel. The simplest concept in the Bible, and look, if you go out soul winning, you will hear that from people all the time. You will explain the gospel to somebody who's been in a Pentecostal church or a Catholic church or some other Protestant or denomination of some kind that's teaching all this complicated, you know, you can never really know what all the different things you have to do to go to heaven, all these things, and you just give somebody the gospel straight from the Bible, and they're just like, man, I've just never had anyone explain it so simply before. People will say that all the time to you. Because the gospel is simple. You're a sinner. You deserve to go to hell. Jesus paid for those sins, and if you trust only on him, you're saved, you're sealed, it's done. I mean, that's very simple. You know, it's so simple that a child can understand it. Doesn't this make sense? It's so simple that, look, I've seen so many examples of this, by the way. It's so simple that a child raised in church, according to, to the Bible, that, that listens to Bible preaching, whose mom and dad read the Bible to them, whose, whose mom is just reading them the Bible every single day. Look, they will be able to understand these concepts many times way before the age of seven. Because as soon, look, it's the simplest thing in the Bible on purpose. And what I always say to people when you're out preaching the gospel and somebody says that, it's just like, it's like just this, this sigh of relief comes over them. They're like, boy, that is really simple. And, and I always say to them, I'm like, well, would it really be fair? Would it really match your conscience if the gospel was so complicated only the smartest people could understand it? If the gospel was such a complicated, you know, thing that only the smartest people could understand the gospel. Only the theologians could understand it. You know, the, the doctors of, you know, whatever could understand it. No, it's, it's the, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 11, it's simple. It's simplicity. There's a lot of complicated things in the Bible. There's a lot of doctrine in the Bible. There's a lot of prophecy in the Bible that we're looking at through a glass darkly. The gospel is not one of those things. The gospel is very simple. And it's people and false teachers that make it complicated. Right? Look, these concepts of sin and of hell. Turn to Proverbs chapter 13, by the way. And, and of hell and punishment, they're very simple concepts. And by the way, this is why the Bible is so serious about disciplining your children. Because when you are disciplining your children, look, it has to do, it, it ha, it's tied to their salvation. Unless, don't misquote me on that. It's not how they get saved, but it, it, it leads them down the proper road to where they will understand the gospel. Look at Proverbs chapter 13 and look at verse number 24. This is why, you know, when the Bible talks about disciplining your children properly, it's so serious about it. You know, it was like, well, you know, what's the big deal? It's a really big deal. Look at Proverbs 13, 24. It says, he that spareth his rod. Everyone's like, spare the rod, spoil the child. That's not what the Bible says. That's like made up NIV version or whatever that is. Or just, you know, some, you know, some rip off, watered down version of what the Bible is trying to say. It says, he that spareth the rod hateth his son. It's like, if you don't spank your children, we're not talking about child abuse. We're talking about spanking and co physically correcting your children in a loving way. It says if you don't do that, because everyone's like, oh, I just I don't want to be mean and all this. No, you hate your son. I'm sorry. I don't know how many Christians I've met that just, they won't do it. They will not spank their children. They won't. I don't want to be mean. They, they just like, they're, they're weak. The man is, is weak, and he just doesn't want to hurt anyone's feelings. It's like, hey, but you hate your son. No, I don't. I love my son. Well, the Bible says you hate him. Remember, love and hate is what you do, not how you feel. So if you don't spank your children, you hate your son. You hate your children. You're like, man, that's a really extreme statement. 
But it says, he that loveth him chasteneth him be times. Look, if you love your children when they are young, and look, I'm going to tell you something. I, I don't spank my kids now. You know, which is, you know, I'm, a, I'm supposed to be an example to you. I, don't, I, I never spanked my kids after they were, I think, 10 years old. But when they were little kids, like, they got spanked all the time. But I, I mean, I didn't spank my Like, you should be done spanking them by the time they're 10. If you're like, oh, man, I got an 18-year-old, and, like, I just got to keep spanking him. Like, there's a problem here. You probably didn't spank him when he was one, two, three years old. And now, you know, you're not going to go spank your 22-year-old or whatever. It's weird. <laughs> you know? I mean, I, I guess, you know, and look, people have different opinions on when you should stop spanking your kids. But, like, whenever I thought, like, okay, this is going to be weird, you know, I kind of stopped spanking my kids. And, you know, like, there's other things you can punish them with when they get to be a little older. But, you know, you know, you know I'm kind of listening to my conscience there a little bit, all right? So, I mean, that's just me. That's how I did it. Um, everyone may differ a little bit there. But the point I'm trying to get you to understand is this is directly tied to them understanding the gospel. You don't believe me? Turn to Proverbs 23. Turn to Proverbs 23. Look at verse number 14. Proverbs 23. Look at verse number 14. You explain, explain if disciplining your children properly by spanking them doesn't have anything to do with the gospel. Explain this statement to me then. Look at Proverbs 23 and verse number 14. Proverbs 23 it says, thou shalt beat him with the rod and shall deliver his soul from hell. You're like, what? First of all, again, not talking about child abuse, not talking about, you know, you know, it, it's just, it's talking about physically spanking, punishing your children. And it says, you will deliver them from hell. You say, what do you mean? It says, you know what it's talking about? It's, it's saying what the message that you're giving them if you don't spank your children, is that sin is no big deal. The message that you're giving them when you, um, they do things wrong, and then you're like, hey, uh, stop it. Um, one, two, I'm going to count to three, two and a half, 2.8, and like, I mean, how many times have you done this? I'm going to count to 50. You know, like, look, the kids, you know what you're doing? Or I'm going to put you in time out. The kids are like, ooh. <laughs> what you're doing is you're literally teaching your kids, if you do all these other methods of, you know, worldly discipline, what these other methods are doing is teaching your kids that consequences aren't real. You're teaching your kids like, oh, is a, is a two-year-old recognize that he's a sinner? No, but a two-year-old recognizes he, if he does something that dad told him not to do, that he's going to get spanked on his bottom and it's going to hurt. It's going to sting. Okay? And he's going to recognize just this simple concept of what? Consequences. That way, when this idea of the gospel comes in, what's the first step? Sin. Next step, consequences. Serious consequences. You know, like God's not going to put you in time out. Okay? When you die as a sinner and you have not accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, God's not going to be like, well, one, two. He's, no, it's, it's hell and that's for eternity and it's real. So that's why the Bible is so serious in Proverbs 13 and Proverbs chapter 23 about telling you, like, look, you better discipline your kids. You better spank them. You know, when they need to be spanked, you spank them. You're like, but I got to spank them 12 times a day. Do it. That's what needs to be done. Look, and look, I'm telling you, if you spank them when they're young, you don't have to spank them when they're 10. It's just, it just works that way. Because you raise them right, and then they move in the right direction. You know, the Bible actually works. Not only is this going to lead them to understand the first couple steps of the gospel, it actually works. The Bible actually works, folks. You want to raise godly children that want to just that want to serve the Lord with their own life? One day, this is how you do it. I don't care if it hurts your feelings. I don't care if you're weak. You're like, you know, you're you're a weak man and you can't stand to see your kids, you know, shed a tear or whatever. Look, and here's another thing, just from personal experience, we actually had a foster child for uh, 
I think it was over two years, we had a foster child. And so we had a child in our house, we had one young child, and then we had a foster child. And I've literally, I've literally seen this scientific experiment play out because we could not spank the foster child. That was the rule. And look, we followed those rules. We followed the proper rules with the foster child. So one child we could not spank, and our own child, like the, it just drove the social worker crazy. She would come in like, talk to us about, you know, come do checkups or whatever on how the child was doing. And of course, um, with our oldest child, um, we spanked him, and we just told the, the social worker, look, it's not illegal to spank your kids, folks. Yeah. You're in a grocery store or whatever, and everyone's like, oh, you know, ooh. it's not illegal. It's not against the law. It's not against the law to spank your children, yeah. right? I mean, I don't think I ever spanked my kids in public, but it may, I don't know, maybe my wife has, I'm not sure. But the point is that it's not illegal. And the social worker say, well, do you spank your own children? And it's like, well, absolutely. And well, I just, I, I don't care what you have to, I mean, I didn't say it that way, but like it, you have no authority over my own family. But with, uh, we took classes on timeout, on how to do timeout and how to do all this stuff. We couldn't even stand them in the corner. Remember, we have to stand in the corner when you get in trouble in school or whatever. You, I'm sure they don't do that anymore. But we couldn't even do that. It was just timeout. And first of all, nobody does timeout correctly. We took like a whole class on timeout. But timeout's a joke. Time out's a joke that they just don't take it seriously. Ooh, you made me sit in a chair. Ooh. You know, I mean, the thing, and here's another thing. With time out and doing time out properly, when the foster child would do time out, we would put him in time out, and look, if they mess up or they do something, then the time out starts over. This could be a long, drawn-out process for like half an hour, an hour. Look, some kid does something, like our child did something wrong. Dad comes home. This is what the child did. Dad goes in, spanking. Hug, you understand what you did wrong? Hug, let's go play ball. Like seven seconds. I mean, it's just, it's the perfect solution to the problem. And what does it do? It just shows like hard consequences. Like it doesn't mean that, you know, I don't love you anymore. And, and we t always talked about that. And, and it, was, it was done. I don't, I, don't, I don't like spanking you. I don't like being at work. And then not getting to see you all day long. And I got to come home. And now I got to give you a spanking. But you know what? That's the way it's going to be. And then we make up and we go throw the ball around. I mean, that's, you know, it's just over, just like that. And you're back to that uh, relationship again. But the point I'm trying to get you to understand is that this is teaching children at a very young age that things are wrong, things are right, and the things that are wrong have consequences. And that is the first step to the gospel. This is why a kid that is, that is in church, that's being taught the Bible, that is having the Bible played out in his life, that has loving parents that are actually chastising him, actually spanking him, they will get, they will get saved at a young age. Because they'll start asking you questions. They'll hear the, the pastors talking about the gospel constantly. They're out soul winning with you, and you're preaching the gospel to people constantly. And they're going to be like, hey, you know, um, at some point, when they're five, six, seven years old, I don't know when that is with, with different kids, but they're going to start asking you questions like, uh, I think I need to be saved. Um, how do I know if I'm going to heaven? All these things. And guess what? Then you preach them the gospel, and you're like, the first part of the gospel, sin, the sin that you have, son, you know the sin that you do? Yeah, I know, Dad. I know I have that sin. That has consequences. The consequences for that is hell. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've heard, yeah, I've heard you tell this before, and it's just like, it's just going to be easy. They'll just accept it like, like, a, like a perfect key fits a perfect lock. So it's very simple. Kids raised in church, reading the Bible, hearing the Bible preached, will get saved many times younger than seven years old. I, I've seen it many times. Which means they're in no danger, literally no danger at all. I mean, look, then there's kids sometimes nine or ten years old that have never been in church. This is the other side. Never been in church. Maybe they didn't have loving parents that were disciplining them properly, teaching them what was right, what was wrong. Now, look, we're finding kids out there today that never even heard of Jesus. G uh, G who's Jesus? They don't know. Look, yeah, it, was, it was hard to find this type of thing five plus years ago. Now you're starting to see kids all the time don't know who Jesus is. No idea. Look, many times these kids are going to have a harder time understanding the gospel. Many times. And also, by the time they're nine or ten years old, They've got other ideas forming in their head already. See, we ran into this Wednesday or Sunday. I can't remember. Just a couple soul winning times before we ran into these kids and uh, Jacob approached these kids 
they were about 9, 10 years old, maybe 11 years old, about, about Jacob's age, maybe a little bit younger, completely uninterested. Already. Already. What was it with them? Well, they were just into all these video games that they had sitting in front of them. Like they're sitting outside in the sun playing video games, which is, you know, another sermon in itself. But the point is, is just like, you see, they're not in church. They don't know the Bible. And they never heard of Jesus. They, they don't have a conviction in their heart about sin or the consequences for that. Completely uninterested in knowing how to go to heaven. Because, I mean, that was the question. Hey, do you guys want to know how to go to heaven? Do you guys know if you're going to heaven? Don't care. Busy. So, you see the importance of, you know, raising children properly when we look at this idea of, you know, the knowledge of sin, uh, you know, brings death upon them. Turn to Matthew chapter 19. See, the Bible, folks, the, just to con conclude this morning, the Bible has all the answers. So anybody that is telling you, well, there's not really a good answer to that, well, especially when it comes to salvation. Look at Matthew chapter 19, look at verse number 14. This also makes this verse actually make sense, and the Catholics and the Lutherans especially will misuse this verse, talking about you know, how you know, children need to be baptized. <laughs> look at verse number 14 of Matthew chapter 19. It says, But Jesus said, Suffer the little children. And forbid them not to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. It's talking about they're, they're innocent. Catholics and Lutherans will say, oh yeah, you know, infants can believe. And they'll use this verse. And you're just like, what are you talking about? First of all, it's little children. Little children. Like, so they're changing their doctrine on babies. They're, they're, they're liberalizing their doctrine. Just like they're liberalizing their doctrine on everything. They're liberalizing their doctrine on babies, but they literally have no answer for little children at all. So like I said, if you want to stump a priest, there, there's your question right there. But the Bible has all the answers. You say, you know, the, the, the theoretical question you get asked all the time is, like, what about the child in Africa? I mean, the Bible has all the answers. There's, there's, what about the child in Africa? There's three, there's three possibilities for the child that grew up in South American jungle or what, whatever you want to say. The, the first possibility is that, you know, that two-year-old, three-year-old child dies early, dies young, is in heaven. That's, that's possibility number one. Then you're like, well, okay, that child grows up to be a pagan unbeliever, like their, their, their relatives or their family or, or whatever they grew up in, you know, and then they, they are going to, if they don't seek the truth, they're going to pay for their own sin. Their own what? Their own actual sins they commit. Not some original sin that was put on them that's fake doctrine. Right? But look, there's another third option, is that they have the conscience in their heart, and they seek the truth, and God promises that they'll find the truth in that case. And that's what missionaries are for. That's what soul winners are for. That's what we're doing. We've got soul winning. Amen. We're, we're finding the people that are seeking. We're finding those people. And we'll talk, look, there's too many non-thinking people out there it is the problem. We'll talk about this tonight. But when somebody, when any church or any spiritual leader of any kind or any false teacher or any teacher of any kind, let me just say it that way, tells you that, you know, uh, regarding salvation that there's just no real answer or, or that here's two words that the Lutheran church will teach this. It's a paradox. They'll talk about salvation is a paradox. A paradox is like it's a one and a zero at the same time. It's like they're like doing quantum theory, right? It's like, no, salvation is simple. It is not a paradox. The, the Catholic things I was reading last week about this says it's a quandary. When people start using this word, these words around you, talking about salvation and the gospel, or what they think is the gospel. A quandary means it's perplexing or uncertain. The gospel is not uncertain. It is simple. You must depart these teachings because the gospel is simple for everyone. So simple that a small child can understand it. A child of four, five, six, Seven years old 
can understand the gospel. Very simple. It's for everyone. So the age of accountability. It's not a definition in the Bible, but it is a very clear concept laid out in the Bible. And look, you just have to have the right gospel in order to understand it. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.